Trojan fans, it's game week. Are you ready for some football? You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC your first listen every day. Whether you're watching me on YouTube or wherever you like to download your podcast, we are free. I still appreciate your support. You can show your appreciation and get us close to that 4,000 subscriber number. If you're watching on YouTube, it's easy. Hit that subscribe button. Smash that thumbs up button. It means a lot to the show. And look, we're, on, we're in game week. You don't want to miss one episode five times a week. Hit that bell notification button and you're covered. This episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. It's going to help you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on college. Terms and conditions will apply. All right. Because you're watching this episode first thing Monday morning, it means there are literally just five days left until the USC kicks off versus San Jose State. Here, it's game week. It also means heading into this past weekend, USC held their Salute to Troy networking tailgate. It's back. Bigger, better, fireworks display and everything to close out the show. Salute to Troy. <coughs> Pardon me. That's when you uh, you get to meet your team captains. And your 2023 team captains were revealed. Caleb Williams, Justin Dietrich, and Shane Lee. They're returning second year as a captain. Joining them, uh, you've got two new guys, Jonah Monheim and Mason Cobb, linebacker, Oklahoma State. Now, just one thing I want to bring up. Caleb Williams told the crowd that went to Salute Detroit, um, and he's been he told the crowd what I've been telling everybody lately. USC will be going to the playoffs and to the national championship game. Yeah, he was out there trying to get the crowd pumped up, but I think he really feels it. Caleb and Justin and Shane Lee, they're returning as captains. It's a big honor being able to do it twice, let alone once. And last year, those three, as well as Thule, we have Pelo to, uh, they were the captains. There was four. There was five this season. Superman, Caleb Williams, we know he's a team leader. He's going to put everybody on his back, ride everybody into uh, into the playoffs. Justin Dietrich, look, as far as I'm concerned, he is literally the heart and soul of the program. And then you've got the two newcomers, um, and I don't think those guys really should. Their additions, putting the C on their, on their chest, it shouldn't surprise anybody. Not only did Jonah switch to the left tackle spot, ahead of fall camp. Uh, my everyday listeners and viewers are going to remember me quoting offensive line coach Joss Henson from a Friday show. This is what he had to say about Jonah. He looks really good, very consistent. Uh, and he was talking about Jonah playing on the left side, just like he was at right tackle, just a really consistent guy. He's always on top of his job. Rarely does he lose fast. Very rarely. That's what the mark of a good lineman is. As an offensive line coach, when you rarely look over and have to watch a guy because you're confident he's going to get his job done, that's when you know you feel pretty good about it. Jonah's a really good player. Well, his Jonah's teammates feel the same way. They know they can turn to Jonah whenever they need to, and there's someone they can fall back on to get the answer, to tell them what they need to do. So he was already seen as one of the team's go-to guys uh, when something needed to be handled. Now he's a starting offensive line at the left tackle position, and he gets to wear the C. High honors. Um, Mason Cobb, much like Shane Lee last year, I don't think he he needed a whole lot of time to assert himself coming over as a transfer. 
And I'm not sure when he decided to become more outspoken, uh, but his work ethic did plenty of talking. Literally, before he knew it, Riley had moved. He, I don't know if you remember, but I talked about it when Mason found out that he was going to be joining Caleb Williams and Lincoln at Pac-12 Media Day. He was moved to tears. So he, when when you have that kind of passion, and we're going to talk about passion in the next segment, but when you have that kind of passion, your 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 peers, your teammates, they sense that type of stuff. So for me, um, it would be real easy to to vote him as a team captain. And here's the other thing: anyone who says they felt uh, the same pain that his future teammates, his soon-to-be teammates, were experiencing during that conference championship game, you know that's a natural leader. He talked about that uh, at Pac-12 Media Day. <coughs> How he experienced, um, actually, it was, at, it was after, during one of the fall camp practices that he talked about that. I, I, I take that back. If uh, you go back and watch the video interviews that we have up at wrsc.com, I might even put it up on the Locked On USC channel as well, but it's out there. Mason talks about he he was feeling that pain watching his his teammates not being able to execute and experience what it takes to win to get to the playoffs. Look, at the other linebacker spot, your other uh, team captain Shane Lee. He he may or he might he may not start this year. Doesn't matter. Who cares? He's going to play, and he's going to play a lot. Just keep in mind, it's the players on the team who vote for their for their captains, for their leaders. And Lee's leadership on and off the field, it's among the best on the, on the roster. You're going you're gonna to have a hard time finding somebody who does more culture stuff than Shane Lee. And look, like I said, his teammates know he might lose a starting spot. But Shane was one of the first guys to come over to USC to believe to believe in the, the whole rebuilding uh, process that Lincoln Riley was taking on. He left Alabama to come to USC to make that happen. I've talked with a few people who were at the Salute to Troy event, and the general consensus was it was kind of just a meh, not a big deal. Kind of a tempered enthusiasm. And I, I think that's because that two-game losing streak left a sour taste in some mouths. Now, with that said, I'm not if you want to use salute to Troy as a way to kind of gauge the the, the temperature of the fan base, maybe that's one way. Um so if you're thinking, well, you know, that might be a that kind of might tell us what the first game's attendance might look like. Maybe, maybe not. I still anticipate north of 60,000 fans for the opener against San Jose State. Here's the thing, though. There's still tickets available. Pretty good seats, too, from what I understand. During USC's Halcyon days, 2003, 2004, 2005, um, USC averaged around anywhere from 75 to 78,000 fans per game. And in 2004, it was up to 85,000. Now, part of that obviously had to do with USC's schedule, and much of it also had to do with SC's winning ways and everyone wanting to jump on that bandwagon before, you know, before those bigger name games arrived. Keep in mind, back then the Coliseum, its capacity attendance was over ninety thousand. It's been downsized since then, but those same crappy seats, you know, in the upper atmosphere of the peristyle end of the uh, of the field, upper corners, those are uh, those are hard seats to sell, even in a seventy seven thousand seat stadium. So it's just great sight lines, but you're you're in another zip code. So hopefully the fan base doesn't disappoint the team or Lincoln Riley, who have been pleading 
um, to, to fill up the Coliseum, to pack it for every single home game. I'm going to say it again. For those of you who got to go to Salute to Troy and you heard Caleb Williams speak, generational players don't come around too often. And you're going to have limited opportunities left to see Superman perform. Don't end up resenting the fact that you sat at home instead of standing at the Coliseum. I'll always refer to standing at the Coliseum because I was a member of the Thundering Herd back when Pete Carroll was coaching the program. Back then, you could tell USC had a really solid foundation. In 2023, the foundation is stronger than it was in 2022 when Lincoln Riley first got here. And because of that, there's some people believing USC can go undefeated. We're going to talk about that more in the next segment. These days, every single potential new hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. And you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster, and they do it for free. And as easy as it is to use LinkedIn to find a job, it's also just as easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. Once you add your job listing, you're then going to take your job and that purple hashtag hiring frame, and you're going to attach it to your own personal LinkedIn profile. That's going to spread the word that you're hiring. LinkedIn's going to provide you simple tools like screening questions. That's going to make it easy for you to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experiences so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to hire. And recruiting the right person for your team means a better product. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified camps you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com forward slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions will apply. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so, look, the LA Times, one of their great columnists, Bill Plaschke, he's jumped on the USC hype train. This is what he had to say. They have the best college football player in the country. They have the best offensive football coach in the country. USC, they have the best offensive analyst in the country, referring to Cliff Kingsbury. They play in the most fertile name, image, and likeness market in the country. There's not one moment that should be considered too big, not one trip that should be feel too far, and not one game in which they won't be favored. They have the star, the smarts, the savvy, the salesmanship, and the schedule to own the autumn and dominate into the winter. The conversation around the 2023 Trojans football program should begin with one word, undefeated. Okay, let's talk about this team's foundation. Look, I said that over a month ago, USC is going to go undefeated. They're going to go 12-0 during the regular season. And I don't have a Westward Ho article that's still aging like one of those McDonald's hamburgers. Years ago, Bill Plaschke had the audacity to write a story, um, one that he said, UCLA runs at Los Angeles. It, it wasn't one of his finer moments. And that's why I said, it's still aging to this day, like a McDonald's hamburger. USC fans will never, ever let Plaschke live that down because that season is when they took over. They literally not only owned Los Angeles, they ended up owning the college football world. But I think plaschke has been reading and hearing the same things that I see in a report. Who knows? Maybe he even reads or watches Locked on USC. I don't know. I can find out, though. 
USC's foundation is set and big things are really anticipated in 2023. It started last year when Lincoln Riley showed up. This is what I wrote about in my Sunday takeaway. You can check that out over there on wersc.com when you're done with this episode. I wrote that, and I got this, I, I guess what gave me the idea is if you've been on Twitter over the weekend, you might've seen a, a really cool tweet about a life lesson, about a minute and a half, but it just sells it perfectly. And family, health, friends, USC football, these are the things that we're really passionate about. If you're watching this show, you know I am. And those are the ingredients that we pour from our passion bucket. And those are what literally form those important building blocks to the foundation. That's what USC is being what is build, building their foundation on. The team, the health of their team. Everyone being on the same page. I, so the, the challenge with, with focusing on what's important is not letting the small stuff get in the way. The small stuff being, you know, the outside noise, talking about going to the playoffs and the championships and how good you are. That's not what the team's focused on. They're focusing on building that foundation. And it sounds simple, but it's, again, being able to shut the windows and, and keep the noise out while you're you're building your house, it's, it's difficult. And so what we try and do in life, you know, focus on our family, our friends, our life, our job, our cars, things that, you know, we want to, that give us safety and security, make us feel good. Football teams are built the same way, if you think about it. They built, they're built on the same principles, the same ideas. Focus on what you can control, the things that you literally can do yourself. So it doesn't matter if you're trying to build in Los Angeles, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or Columbus, Ohio. It doesn't matter. Where and how a team's foundation gets built doesn't matter as long as you accept that there's going to be noise, there's going to be distractions, but you've got to focus on those building blocks, the principles that we build our daily lives around. <coughs> Pardon me. And this is what Lincoln Riley has been trying to educate the team, <clears throat> instill into the team. It doesn't matter how long it takes or how long you talk about it, because the longer it goes, the better we get. That's the message that they've been instilling in the program since the spring, summer, and then through the fall. During the workouts, the longer it goes, the better we get. Talked about in our last episode of Locked on USC. But we know that even the most well-built homes with strong foundations, just like the best football teams, eventually they're going to get tested over time foundation you know injuries happen players feelings emotions get involved how you deal with adversity so it's it's how it's how you deal with those types of distractions those types that adversity when it happens how you deal with it so when just like with the, your house, when the seasons change, you gotta, you kind of have to start dealing with different issues. Still, you so when that happens, you you add, you bring extra, you add, I don't know, you bring extra attention to those small problems so they don't become big problems. USC did that. They went, they attacked the transfer portal. They got some raw materials to help with the defense. Alex Grinch talked about it. He said, if you can't put together a two, when it comes to practice, if you can't put together a Tuesday and a Wednesday in two hours on the practice field versus the scout team, it's going to be really hard to play 60 minutes against an elite opponent when you're talking about championship games. What he was saying is if, if you want a stronger defense and a better chance to win a championship game, 
kind of like when you're building that house. Measure it twice before you cut it one time. Make sure everything is the right fit. You know, before you before you put the paint on the walls, make sure they're primed. Sand away all those rough spots. You know, make sure the pipes and the plumbing, they, they've been properly sealed before you turn on the water. Look, you can use all the cardinal and gold paint in the world to try and cover up something that's poorly built. USC's defense last year looked like it was poorly built. It's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. It's still going to be ugly. Caleb Williams and the Trojans, they want 15 games. They want a chance to play in 15 games in 2023 and 2024. He's talked about it. So the conference realignment, winning the last, you know, winning the, the last Pac-12 championship game, making the playoffs. That's, I talked about, that's some of the noise that USC's football team is, is trying to keep out until it's time to open one of those 15-game windows. USC opens their first window in less than a week. That's when they play San Jose State. Have to get rid of that video. It's kind of bugging me a little bit too. <laughs> I'm having, I might be having a little bit of internet issues here. Uh, Hurricane Hillary is bother, is busting up my Wi-Fi, so I'm doing this with a hot spot. Hopefully it's working out okay. I think it is. So far, I haven't seen any hodgepodge stuff going on. So again, USC added, they brought in did some added attention trying to fix their, the foundation of their home that needed some attention. They brought in some really quality building blocks. Mason Cobb, Jack Sullivan, Keon Bars, Anthony Lucas. They brought those guys in so they don't experience another type of two-lane collapse. And that's why Alex Grinch is still around. This is why Lincoln Riley kept him around. He said, look, I've been through it enough with that guy to know. Don't bet against him. I know what he's made of. I just do. And I know it's getting ready to happen defensively. And I and so I just have a confidence and a belief there. I know we have the right person there. USC also believes they have the right people in place on the defensive side of the ball. <clears throat> At Pac-12 Media Day, the message was, this is from Lincoln Riley. Listen, we have a great opportunity in front of us. I think everybody within our program, every player senses that and wants to do a great job of taking advantage of this. These windows are short. You only get so many shots at this. Individual guys here and there, that's great. But you got to get them to coexist and to work together and act as one on all three sides of the ball. That's, that's the fight right now. The narrative is all these things return. Everybody thinks you pick up where you left off, and that could and that could not be further from the truth. It's everything. It's it's everything's different. We've got so many different faces, and I think just the group coming together and learning to not to not just be a group of some talented guys, but a group that plays very well together. We've got to close that gap here. Lincoln Riley is trying to say there's it's still a work in progress here's the thing the foundation it's set they brought on some nice additions to the rooms i talked about those players those things are going to fit in just nicely usc's going to open their first window against san jose state this saturday hopefully everybody will be out there to check it out. We're going to start breaking down San Jose State. We're in game week, right? Let's talk about who USC plays. Trojans versus Spartans. This is what San Jose State head coach Brent Brennan had to say regarding Caleb Williams. I've never seen a college football player like Caleb. That's just my own opinion. I'm 27 years in, I think, I've, and I've never seen anybody like him. He's just brilliant in every way, 
and then you add that with just the normal high-level talent at USC, and then what they've been able to add through NIL money, right? And so I think you're looking at a kind of football team that maybe we've never seen in college football before. End quote. That right there encapsulates what Nick Saban was alluding to when he was talking about how USC has an unfair advantage. He continued. And so that's what I'm excited to see. It's just to see is just how that feels on the field. What does it look like? How do we compare? How do we match up in those, you know, play by play down by down versus those versus that USC team? Because they got excellent personnel everywhere. They're obviously very well coached. So, you know, for us, it's about playing good football, end quote. All right. So let's talk about the unfair advantage. Vegas and the odds makers agree. USC is a 30 point favorite going into this game. Caleb, he's got his Heisman Award and he's the favorite to win it second time this year. But we've already talked about it. He wants a playoff appearance this year. Here's what Caleb said Quote, not just for myself, but for everybody overall. Most of the guys, they are just, most of the guys that are playing have been in the offense for a while. The confidence in the scheme and things like that of his team's comfort, comfort ability. After you get a year under your belt, you get a bunch of trials and tribulations. You get a bunch of successful plays and things like that, but it helps to build confidence overall. Then you get to work on it during the whole summer, and that's what we've been doing. So Caleb, as far as his offense is concerned, he knows what he likes the best. USC fans, you're going to start to see some of that on Saturday. Who are the Spartans? What is Caleb going up against? What's the, what's the whole USC team going up against? Last year, they were 7-5, and five, and they returned six starters on offense and another five starters on defense. They're going to be led by a sixth-year quarterback. His name is Siobhan Cordero, and they have a senior running back. His name is um, Kyrie Robinson. Those are the two guys on offense. Again, Cordero, sixth season, all in the Mountain West. He played at Hawaii for his first five years, and then he came in and threw uh, 3,251 yards and 23 touchdowns and added nine rushing scores so he can run the ball. And I believe uh, he ran for 265 yards. He's a veteran, but they actually have a backup just in case. Oregon backup. Uh, his name is Jay Butterfield. He was one of those highly recruited quarterbacks in uh, during the Mario Cristobal era up there at Oregon. He wasn't able to crack it up there, so transferred to San Jose State. Now, the Sparty offense... Um, they were actually considered the best in the Mountain West last year. They were, they were considered the best at not turning the ball over. <laughs> They're going to need to make sure they don't reverse that trend against USC because we know last year USC was pretty good at taking the ball away. And if a Spartan offense wants to improve, apparently they need to improve their running game. And they have hope that they're going to be able to do that because they've got a front five that they anticipate is going to be better. They've got a a 315-pound center. His name's Anthony Pardue. Kyrie Robinson, their running back, he led the team last year with 750 yards rushing, 10 touchdowns. And I mentioned the quarterback likes to take off and run as well. So who knows? Maybe USC's defense is going to get a test, is going to get tested a little bit against San Jose State. I don't know if the uh, USC secondary will be tested. Apparently, the, the Spartans wide receiver group is kind of being patched together. Um, however, they do have a tight end. His name is Dominic Mazzotti. He's got all Mountain West potential if he stays healthy. Let's just hope from a USC fan perspective that he doesn't look like an All-American by the time the game is over. Again, that's one of the areas that USC has hopefully addressed during the offseason, getting that nickel spot better qualified to handle tight ends. Defensively, uh, San Jose State is led by a linebacker named Brian Parham, and 
strong safety Trey Jenkins. <coughs> Pardon me, man. I apologize. San Jose um, on defense, they're replacing a lot, especially their pass rush, which was last year one of the better one better units in the Mountain West Conference. They lost Cade Hall and Velami Vihoko. Those are two defensive ends. Depth is also going to be an issue for them up front. USC fans, we know what a lack of depth up front can do. Um, but they tend to be strong, at least over the nose of the ball. And I mentioned the linebackers are going to be solid. Brian Parham, he's an he's 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 undersized, but he probably looks more like a Matt Grudigan playing linebacker, that hybrid role. Uh, but he does everything. And last year he was second on the team with tackles, um, hit 74. Now, again, it's San Jose State, a lot of programs in the uh, group of five, especially the Mountain West, um, they're getting a lot of players leaving power the uh, Power Five programs. For instance, or former Oregon State Beaver, Matthew Tago. Um, he is uh, going to be part of their secondary, playing safety with Trey Jenkins. So that might be their best defensive unit is in the secondary, at safety. We'll find out because, again, USC, San Jose State, they're going to kick off this Saturday, five days away. That game cannot get here fast enough. I will continue to break down San Jose State throughout the week. Once again, thank you for making Locked on USC your first listen every day. Now, once you're done with this episode, because we are coming to an end, go check out the Ultimate College Football Preview, Pac-12 edition. It's over there on YouTube. I take the hosts from Oregon, Utah, and Washington behind the woodshed. I tell them why USC is going to go undefeated, why USC is going to win the conference championship game, and why USC is going to make the playoffs. I think you're going to enjoy it. So until the next episode of Locked on USC, everyone, you know what to do. You are Locked on Trojans. You're